thankful for that we have to gather together here to sing these songs of praises and lift up your high and holy name exalting you above all others it is you who has given us life it is you who has given us the ability to be called your children and father we're thankful that you loved us enough that you have provided that pathway for us through your son jesus christ who came to this earth lived as we lived tempted as we are tempted in all points but never once did he sin and when the time came appointed to him, he willfully went to the cross of Calvary, suffering the pain and agony there because he, was, he knew we needed a redeemer from sin, that we could not save ourselves, and he took our place, dying for us, shedding his precious blood there on the cross that has washed us and cleansed us from the stain of sin that separates us from you. Buried in a barred tomb and three days later, rising victoriously and triumphantly over death, and now has been ascended back to you and sitting at your right hand, advocating for us, even as we speak. Father, we're thankful for your Holy Spirit that through the ages has inspired men to write down the things that you would have for us to know, that 
we can open your word, we can understand it, we can comprehend it, and we can share it with others so that they too can enjoy the blessings found only in Christ. We're thankful for this congregation that has met here for so many years. And Father, we pray if it be your will that it could continue for many more, that many generations of individuals, not only in this community, but throughout this world, could come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, and that they too could be washed in the blood of the Lamb, and they too could have that hope of eternal life once this life is over. We thank you for every single person in attendance in here today that has made the effort to be here with us, that we would all be strengthened and encouraged by one another, that we could lean upon one another in times of trials and tribulations, that we could rejoice with one another in times that we are celebrating life's victories, and that we could mourn with one another in times of loss and grief. Father, this morning we realize that there are those that would love to be here with us. Sister Evelyn Castillo, Brother Philip Warren and his family. So many others that have been limited by age, been limited by sickness, by injury, by, by health. And we pray your blessing upon them that they could be strengthened also, that they could know that they are missed, that they are loved, and we would so dearly love to have, have them back here with us. For those, Father, today that are grieving the loss of loved ones, may they look to you and not turn away from you in, in wrath and anger, but rather realize that this life is, as your word teaches, but a vapor. It is here today and gone tomorrow. And we live our life in such a way to be prepared to stand before you that we could hear you say those blessed words, well done, my faithful servant. May we reach out to those that are grieving those losses and help them understand that they are not going to the valley of shadow death alone. And this, this world is, as we say, passing away every single day. The Father, this morning for those that could have very well been here, but they have chosen to, put, to go back into the world to chase the pleasures of the flesh, Help us to understand the great responsibility that we have to reach out to them, to bring them back, to pull them out of the fire, saving them from sin, and understand the importance of being assembled together with the body of Christ on the first day of the week. Today, Father, we thank you for this nation we live in, the freedom that allows us to gather here without fear of outside interference and persecution. For those men and women that put their lives on the line every single day, Father, we pray your hedge of protection around them, that they seek to protect us from those who wish to do harm to us simply because of calling upon your name. For those in positions to make decisions to keep us a free people, we pray that they would seek your knowledge, that they would seek your wisdom in those decisions that they make. And when they refuse to, and they refuse to go along with your plan and your will, may we seek the opportunities to remove them from those positions and give someone else a chance to do what is right by your word. Father, though, more importantly, we acknowledge and we recognize that we are citizens of a much higher kingdom than this world has and ever will know. And that is the kingdom of Jesus Christ that he has died and shed his blood for, that he is reigning over today. May we suit up in your armor every single day to go to battle against the ultimate enemy of Satan who seeks to devour and destroy the souls of those we love and even the complete stranger that we meet on the streets. Today, Father, we pray that everything we say and do would be in accordance to your will that what is said here could be uplifting and encouraging to those that could be instrumental in showing them the truth in a world full of confusion that people can see your name proclaimed, but they don't see your will proclaimed. May we always stand in the gap prepared to go to battle against false doctrine that is stealing the souls of, of our friends and family and neighbors every single day. We pray, Father, that if there's any sin laid to our charge at this time, that you would forgive us of that, None of us are perfect. We never will be, but we can strive to walk in the steps of foot, the footsteps of Jesus. And when we stray away, your word tells us that the blood he shed on the cross of Calvary who redeem us from sin can continually cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we confess our faults to you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Mark your books at number 256. 256 will be our song of invitation. <clears throat> and let me get to where I need to be at here. Bear with me just a second. I meant to make a note this morning and I forgot to make a note to remind me to make a note. Let 
Let me go ahead and be swapping this over. <clears throat> well, I can't find it now. Be turning with me this morning to John chapter 16, verse 18. John chapter 16, verse 18. And for the time we have this morning, what I want us to take a look at is people ask for a lot of things from God. And what I want us to focus on today as many times people ask for things that they don't even know what they're asking for. And in John chapter 3, excuse me, John chapter 16, I think I said John 3, I apologize. John 16, John chapter 16. We see Jesus speaking. Down around verse 16. Notice what he says. He's speaking to the, his disciples and he says, A little while and you will not see me. And again in a little while you will see me because I go to the Father. Then some of his disciples said to themselves, What is it that he says to us? A little while and you will not see me. And again in a little while you will, you will see me because I go to the Father. Therefore they said, What is it that he says? A little while. We do not know what he is saying. Many people today, excuse me, will ask for baptism of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever been in a discussion with someone about baptism? They'll ask, were you baptized in the Holy Spirit? Did the, did the Spirit come upon you? They don't understand what they're saying. They want to go back to the book of Acts in the first chapter, and they completely take it out of context when they see Holy Spirit baptism come upon the apostles on that day of Pentecost. And they think that that is reserved for us as well. Now what Jesus is leading into here, when you read on, you'll see where he says, but the comforter, the Holy Spirit will come to you. Well, we have the Holy Spirit today. It's called the written word. That's how the Holy Spirit speaks to us today, through the written, the written word. Jesus Christ is the word. The word became flesh, John tells, tells us and. John chapter 1, then the beginning of 1 John chapter 1. And they want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. But what they fail to understand is on that day of Pentecost, that was a tool, that was a way of God showing, I am ushering in a new covenant. You see, those on the day of Pentecost were there. Why? Because they were living under the old covenant. They were living under the Mosaical law. The day of Pentecost was a Jewish tradition. The gospel was to be preached to the Jew first and then to the Greek. God kept his promise. And to show his, we would say today, stamp of approval upon it, here you see the Holy Spirit coming in to the, the 12 in that upper room and those tongues of fire lighting upon them. Let me ask you this. Have you ever heard someone who had no training whatsoever in any kind of foreign language all of a sudden, just boom, be able to start fluently speaking in a foreign language? No, you won't. When we truly look at Acts chapter 2, we see that not only did the apostles, many of whom were uneducated men, they were fishermen, and that's not a slight upon them. We see them, we see that Luke tells us that the crowds there not only understood the language, they understood the dialect as we would say today, our accent. <clears throat> you ever meet someone, <clears throat> I run across people from all over this country these days that are flocking to Middle Tennessee. And more often than not, I'm able to, I'm able to pick out that Midwestern accent to the Texas accent, the people that originated up in the Northeast around Boston. I, I, can, I can pick it out in a heartbeat. You see, the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 2 that not only did these Jewish people on the day of Pentecost 
Not only did they hear their native language, they understood even the accent or the dialect from the various regions that spoke that language. That was a direct operation of the Holy Spirit. That doesn't happen today. Why? Because we have the complete written word. We don't need it. We don't need miracles to confirm the word anymore. Look at Ephesians chapter 4 on this idea of Holy Spirit baptism. When people ask for it, they don't understand what they're even asking for. Because if people were biblically minded, Ephesians chapter 4 would tell them what it is that they're seeking. What does Paul tell the church at Ephesus? Start at verse 3. Endeavoring to what? Keep the unity of the Spirit in bond and peace. You'll hear a lot of people today say, oh, we just want everybody to get along. We can do that, but there's a standard by which that is to be accomplished. What is the standard? Glad you asked. Paul explains. He says, endeavoring or constantly working to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, there is one body. You want to know why there's no unity in the bond of peace today in the religious world and Christianity? Because there's not one body. People will say, what faith are ye? And they speak out of ignorance. Because the Bible says there is one body, there is one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. Paul is saying, hey, church at Ephesus, you all obeyed the same gospel. There wasn't a set of standards for this group over here and a different set of standards for this group over here. One Lord, one faith, what? One baptism. And that baptism is the same baptism we read about all throughout the book of Acts. Buried in baptism in what? Water. For what? The remission of sins. The forgiveness of sin. The washing away of sins. Acts 22 verse 16. There's no Holy Spirit baptism involved. Well, Cor, what about the household of Cornelius? I'm so glad you brought that up. You see, the household of Cornelius was when the gospel was first preached to anyone outside of the lineage of Abraham. Not a Jew. A Gentile. And you see, salvation had not been offered to the Gentiles without adherence to the Mosaical law. This was God's way of saying, guess what? I'm bringing everybody into the fold now. Whereas before, my blessing, my covenant had been with the direct descendants, the seed of Abraham, and the promise that was made to Abraham that he would make a great nation of him, that even the stars would not be numbered it be more outnumbered by the stars, the, the sands of the seashore. See, God now has got a new covenant, and it's through his son, Jesus Christ. When people ask what they, they don't realize, what is it they're asking for? Look with me at Matthew chapter 3 this morning. People ask things, and they don't even realize what it is they're asking for. Matthew chapter 3, we see John the Baptist being introduced to the story. And down at verse, start about verse 7. John is baptizing in the Jordan. People are coming out to him to being baptized all throughout the region. And in verse 7, but when he saw John saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism. He said to them, stop right here. I will say something right here. People today will tell you, oh, you got to be nice. You, you can't say anything that hurts people's feelings. John didn't get that memo. <clears throat> Somebody forgot to tell John that you just got to be this yellow-bellied, you know, doormat that people walk over and you never say anything offensive to anybody. When John saw the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers, you bunch of snakes. Wait a minute. I'm sorry. Who is John saying this to? 
the religious elite of the day. He's calling them a bunch of snakes. I'm here to tell you today, there are a whole lot of folks sitting in a pew this morning in nice suits and ties. They're all dressed up. And last time I checked, Halloween was about four weeks ago. They're all dressed up, pretending to be this holy thing and they can't wait for the final amen so they can run out to the all-you-can-eat buffet and act like a bunch of heathen. Brood of vipers, you bunch of snakes, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not think to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, to every tree which does not bear fruit or good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Verse 11. I indeed baptize you with water under repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing hand is in his, his fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat in the barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. People ask for fire baptism. Well, fire baptism does not exist for you and I today. It doesn't. It would kind of be counterproductive when you start to think about it. If you and I were engulfed in fire, what's going to happen? You're going to be burned up. Now, that is spoken of. That is reserved for the people in 1 Thessalonians 1, 7 to 9. Who is it that's going to be engulfed in fire? Those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Those are the ones that will be engulfed in fire, surrounded in fire. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 this morning, we're looking at things that people ask for and they just simply ask out of ignorance because they don't know or they've heard somebody talk about it and they don't quite Grasp it and understand it. 1 Corinthians 13, down around verse, oh, start at verse 4. Paul, speaking of the church at Corinth, Corinth was known for being a city just ripe with sin. It was a case study on grace and mercy and forgiveness. That if God could save anybody, he could save the people in Corinth. We, we, many times we think about what Paul himself said, that of sinners he was chief. No one had sinned more than he had. He had murdered people. He had murdered Christians because he thought what he was doing was right. He's is in a good conscience about it. But here in the city of Corinth, a, a, a port, a shipping port, I've, I've many times compared modern day New Orleans to what Corinth might have been like back in the day where you had uh, people moving in, merchants, sea merchants coming and going and got a little money in their pocket and they find a way to get in a little trouble for a few days. But notice what Paul says. He says, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself nor is puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, loves all, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Verse 8. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they'll cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanquish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. Verse 10. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. What's Paul saying? When you ask the Lord to perform some kind of a miracle, it ain't going to happen. Some kind of supernatural, miraculous event, it ain't going to happen. Why? How can you say that? Do you not have faith in God? I absolutely do. Matter of fact, my faith is a lot stronger than yours is. And that's not me being arrogant by saying that. When you say 
that you need some kind of miracle to prove God to you, to prove that God is real to you, you're saying your faith is pretty weak. When I say that my faith in God is strong, I come here. Why is that? What does Paul say? Verse 10, when that which is perfect, when that which is complete has come, the word of God, then all these prophecies, all these tongues, all these miracles will cease. I'm here to tell you, the word of God is complete. What does Paul tell Timothy? The word of God is complete. It is so that the man of God can be fur thoroughly furnished for all things. You and I, we don't need miracles. We don't need miraculous things. We don't need to speak in tongues. We have the word of God as our guide. Nothing more, nothing less. When you ask the Lord to perform a miracle, you don't understand what you're asking for. John chapter 9 this morning, moving along. You do not understand what it is that you ask for. John chapter 9, down about verse 29, 30 or so. We see a blind man that has been healed. And notice, even in verse 20 or so, the Pharisees, the religious elite of the day, are grilling this guy. Who did this to you? How is it you were able to be healed? How is it you have received your sight? And his parents even step in and say, we know that this is our son, that he was born blind. By what means we now see, we don't know. Or who opened his eyes, we don't know. He's of age. Ask him. He'll speak for himself. His parents said these things in verse 22 because they feared the Jews. You ever known people that feared certain people in the church because they had some kind of status? I don't. I don't, I don't care about your status in the church. And I, and I say that mocking you that you have some kind of tiered status better than I do. If you think you're something because of who your family lineage is, I got news for you. I'm going to hurt your feelings. I don't care who you are. You and I are one. We are on equal plane, or we should be. But they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that Jesus was Christ, be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. They called in the man who was blind and said to him, give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, though I was blind, now I see. Verse 26, they said to him again, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered in verse 27, I already told you. and You don't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become one of his disciples? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. The man who was blind and had his sight restored by Jesus being interrogated by the religious elite of the synagogue. And he says, why do you keep asking about this guy? Do you, do you want to be one of his followers? Whew. Verse 28, they reviled him and said, you are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, speaking of Jesus, we don't know where he's from. Verse 30, the man answered and said to them, why? This is a marvelous thing that you do not know where he is from, yet he is opened by eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he fears him. Now I read a lot right there to kind of get some context. But when people think that they can be saved at the mourner's bench, now, many of you may not be familiar with that, but that is a denominational practice where you come up and you, there's a little, there's a literally a, a little bench that you'll kneel down, kneel down at, and oh, you'll put your hands up and you'll pray. Well, if you think that that's where salvation is found, you don't know what you're asking for, because you can pray all day long, but if you are outside of Christ. What is what it said there? God does not hear what? Sinners. Let me tell you who God does hear. 
God hears those who have been washed in the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. God hears those who have come into contact with that blood through the watery grave of baptism. How do they end up at the watery grave of baptism? Through obedience. How do they obey? Because they have to hear. Now, I just went through the plan of salvation backwards for you. What was it that the Ethiopian eunuch was reading? He was reading the book of Isaiah, where the prophet was speaking of Jesus and how he was led as a sheep before his shears. Dumb. Didn't speak. Didn't fight back. And he asked Philip, when Philip said, do you understand what you're reading? What was the eunuch's response? Leave me alone, you know it all. Bible thumper. No, he didn't say that. He said, how can I understand it unless some man guide me, some man help me, some man study with me? And Philip opened his mouth, beginning at the prophet Isaiah, preached Jesus unto him. And what was included in that? Jesus saying, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. You can sit there and pray all night long. You can get down your hands and knees on that little padded bench and pray that God will save you. Paul tried doing that. Saw the apostle. Saul tried doing that when he was confronted by Jesus on the road to Damascus. When he cried out, he said, Lord, who are you? And Jesus said to him, I am you who you are persecuting. Was Saul saved there? Absolutely not. Well, how do you know that, Mr. Know-it-all? Because Ananias, where he was told to go, where Saul was go, told to go into the city and find Ananias, and Ananias found him. What did he say? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sin. Saul was still in his sin. He'd been fasting and praying for three days. I don't know too many people that stay at the mourner's bench for three days. They won't be saved there, just as Saul wasn't saved. You don't know what you're asking for when you want the Lord to save you at the mourner's bench. First Peter chapter 3, i got to move quickly. I'm getting bogged down here. First Peter chapter 3. We all are familiar with this verse. But in verse 18 of 1 Peter chapter 3, people ask the Lord to save them without baptism. They say, oh, baptism is, has nothing to do with salvation. Really. 1 Peter 3, beginning in verse 18, the apostle writes, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh but made alive by the Spirit by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, who once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. Verse 21. There is also an antitype, which now saves us. Baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, not, not taking a bath, but the answer of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God. When someone tells me that baptism has absolutely nothing to do with salvation, that we are saved by faith alone or we're saved by grace alone, they just leave faith completely out of it, that there is nothing for us to do, we just mosey on through life, however we want to, and God's going to save us all. I take them to 1 Peter 3, 21. I ask them to read it to me. And it's usually followed by silence. Why? <clears throat> it clearly states there is an antitype which now saves us. Where water in the day of Noah destroyed those who were disobedient. Now, under the authority of Jesus Christ, water is part of salvation. Water is the dividing line between the lost and the saved. Was water the dividing line that separated the wicked from the righteous? Uh-huh. It was, wasn't it? Where were the righteous found? They were found through obedience in the ark. Why were they in the ark? God instructed Moses. 
build this big old boat, get inside of it, and you'll be saved. You know what the ark is today? Jesus Christ. Put on Christ. In Christ. You find it all throughout the New Testament. How do you get there? Through the water. Through obedience. Not because it's just a thing I feel like I need to do. Because God instructed you to do it. Acts chapter 2. We're looking at what things people today, they ask for. And they don't really know what they're asking for. They think they know, or it just feels like something they ought to do. But in Acts chapter 2, we see the day of Pentecost that we've talked about earlier this morning. We see where the question is asked, men and brethren, what shall we do? We realize that we have crucified the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Peter, taking those keys of the kingdom from Matthew 16, 18, opening the gates of the kingdom, says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We see where 3,000 heeded his words and obeyed the gospel that day. We see where those who obeyed the gospel were in fellowship with the apostles. Fear coming upon every soul in verse 43, seeing the miracles and the signs and the wonders done. They were all in common and had things all together, and they believed together. Verse 46 continuing with one accord daily in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of the heart. In verse 47, those who had obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, who had been baptized for the remission of sins, who had been the part of those 3,000 and growing daily, they were praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily who those who were being saved when you ask the lord to save you apart and outside of his church that is foreign to god's ears why because the saved are where in the church which church the church that jesus said that he would build in matthew 16 you say i don't need the church Maybe you don't. But if you want to enjoy the fruits of salvation, that being eternity with God, you're going to have to be a part of the church. And how do you get there? Well, I get voted in. Wrong. Well, my mom and daddy. Wrong. Well, I paid it. Wrong. I'm an important person in the community. Wrong. Wrong. You're there because the Lord adds you to it because you have met his criteria. And to say that you can be saved, but I ain't part of no church. Well, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but what you're saying is a bunch of gibberish and makes no sense. You cannot be saved outside of the Lord's church. Mark 16, 16. Oh, there he goes back to that again. I sure am. Mark 16, 16. You will hear, and I've already made reference to this statement before, a few moments ago. You will hear people say, well, I can be saved by faith only. No, you can't. Why? Mark 16, 15 and 16. What does Jesus say? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Verse 16. He who believes will be saved. That's what the denominational world would love you to see. Unfortunately, that's not what it says. He who believes and what is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be what? Condemned. Well, it didn't say anything about not being baptized. Uh, let's, let's have a rational discussion. And I know that's hard to have with a lot of people, especially around this little town. Why on earth would you be baptized if you don't believe anything about Jesus? That's usually the response you get. It's usually the response I get from some preachers around here. They don't have an answer. Jesus said, 
Faith leads to obedience being baptism. Why? Because he said so. And that should be the only answer you need. Because Jesus said so. You cannot be saved outside of, what, 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 Corey, 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 what, what, what about somebody hit it? I'm not in a what if game. Neither is Jesus. Neither is God. They are not in the what if game. Now you can take the stance of, well, uh, uh, the, the Lord probably knew they would have to get baptized and go, again, you're playing a dangerous game. First and foremost, if you're going to sit here and tell me that God might have an exemption for someone who might have been on the way to get baptized and got car wrecked and got killed, we can play the what if game all day long. But if God is making exemptions outside of what he has told us, guess what he is? A liar. So if you want to play this game with me, uh, well, 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 he was in the car on the way to get baptized and got killed and a deer jumped out in front of him and killed him and he didn't get baptized, then we might as well just take this whole Bible and just throw it away. Because if we're going to play the what if game all day long, there's no need for us to have this. What are we even doing? Jesus said it, that's what it meant. I tell you what I do read about. I can read about people who when they came to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, the point that they were ready to be obedient to it, they didn't wait. I'm here to tell you, we can find some water to baptize you in just because you're on the way to the church building to get baptized. I promise you, we'll find a body of water somewhere to get you baptized in. I got a stock tank up behind my house, not 100 yards out of my back door. It might be cold this time of year, but guess what? We can dunk you in it. It might be a little nasty. Got some donkey slobber and some leaves in it. Have dead possum in it the other day. But it's water, and it will serve a purpose. There's nothing magical about the Petersburg Water Department, H2O, in this baptistry at 203 Water Street, or Russell Street. Nothing magical about it. We can play the what if game all day long. Jesus said baptism precedes salvation. And that's the end of the story. What are you waiting on? Ephesians chapter 2, we're looking at what people ask and they just don't even realize what they're asking for. Ephesians 2, down at verse 8. Fix and blow your mind here. Because you've heard this verse before and you've heard it many times used out of context. Ephesians 2 verse 8, Paul tells the church at Ephesus, For by grace you have been saved through faith that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You stop right there, that explains the grace-only doctrine. That there is absolutely nothing we have to do for salvation. God has already done all the work. And that we cannot save ourselves through works because then we could boast about what we've done. You see, people today will ask the Lord to save them through grace only, but then they don't bother to read verse 10. Read it with me. For we, Christians, are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Old works have a lot to do. What was it James said? Faith only? Mm -mm. Not by faith only. The only time you will find faith only in the Bible. Not by faith only. There's plenty we're told to do. What was it? What was it? That Saul was told by Jesus himself? Go into the city and there you will be told what you must do. Was Abraham called the friend of God for no reason? 
Uh-uh. Uh-uh. He had to be obedient to God to the point that he was willing to sacrifice his only begotten son. We could get into this discussion for the rest of the morning. I don't want to get bogged down in it. You cannot expect the Lord to save you through grace only. Ephesians 4, we were there momentarily ago. Ephesians 4, the last couple of things we're going to look at this morning. What people ask for and they don't understand what it is they're asking for. People will ask the Lord to bless all the churches. The Baptists, the Methodists, Presbyterians, the ARPs, the Catholics, the whatever. We can go down, we can go down endless list of organizations that consider themselves to be the body of Christ. The problem is, what was it Paul told Ephesus, the church at Ephesus in Ephesians 4 verse 4? There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called, and one hope of your calling. The seven ones of Ephesians 4. You do good to read it sometimes. There's not this plurality. There's not this, well, whatever I think. I got to tell you, as I drive around Williamson County and even starting to see it in parts of Murray County, it's even starting to pop up in Marshall and Lincoln County. We were funeral Tuesday, and I noticed a tract of land adjacent to the cemetery where we were headed. This is the future home of, I don't even remember what the name of the church was. And I thought, man, we're building churches around here by as fast we're building Dollar Generals. Why? Well, <laughs> number one, I don't know where they're finding the money because I don't know if you're aware of this or not, land in Winston County ain't exactly cheap. You think it's expensive here, I'll, I'll, I'll open your eyes. So I don't know where we're getting the money to build all these different quote-unquote churches at. But what happens? Well, somebody gets offended about something over here. They get the feelings hurt about something over here. They don't get their way about something over here. What am I going to do? I'm going to start my own church. It's not the way God intended it. God had one plan, one church. Jesus said, I will build my church. Start doing the research on some of these denominations. They ain't been around as long as Jesus was here. You cannot ask the Lord to bless all the churches. God is not going to bless something that is in direct conflict with what he has taught and instructed. And I don't know why some of us have this hard time of wrapping our head around it. I think I do. It's, well, I got friends that go over there to XYZ denomination church. I got family over there, and I can't imagine God not blessing them. He doesn't. Matter of fact, what was it that Jesus said? He said, anything, any plant not planted by my father will be what? Uprooted, ripped out of the ground. We saw earlier, what was it that John the Baptist said? He's speaking of Jesus prophesying. He says he's coming and he's got his winnowing fan in his hand and he's going to clean out here at this harvest time. You think about all the, the soybeans and the wheat and the, the, the corn that will be harvested either now or over the next several months. What do you got to do? You got to get all the straw out of it. You got to get the stalks out of it. And what do you do with it? Well, back in their days, what did they do? Burn it. Throw it on the fire. Clean up a tree limb that falls down. You save the good trunks. For what? Firewood. But you take them old limbs, a little scraggly stuff, you throw it on the brush pile and get rid of it. It's no use. Jesus has no use for these imposter churches. And he will burn them up. They will be uprooted. Colossians chapter 2, last couple of points. Colossians chapter 2, down about verse 10, 11, 12. Start at verse 11. People today will think the Lord is going to accept sprinkling and pouring as an accepted form of quote unquote baptism. Well, verse 11 of Colossians chapter 2, Paul tells the church at Colossae, he says, In him, Jesus, 
You were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Let me ask that. Romans 6 refers to baptism as a burial. Buried with him in baptism. Again, we have in the last few days attended a funeral, been out in the cemetery, watched the casket lowered into that six foot hole in the ground. Here's the text. They didn't just walk over and say, There's a little bit of dirt, let's go eat. That ain't how it worked. Nope. No, they got that little trailer they back up there and one man on one side, one man on the other. They've got those ratchets and they're pulling that dirt back in there. A couple other people in there with shovels and tamps and they're making sure it gets all around that casket. You don't want any air gaps in it. And a few weeks or months, that ground will be smooth right over. You'll never even know a hole was dug there. Is that a burial? You better believe it. Going over and grabbing a handful of dirt? No. So why would you even attempt to explain to me that the burial in verse 12 here of Colossians 2 is just taking sprinkling a little bit of water over somebody? Stop. Stop. I will tell you something that just makes my heart happy. Is when I see my brethren on social media and the internet with a baptism of an individual. And if there's enough witnesses there, they'll have somebody watching to make sure the entire body goes under that water. I have seen times where someone is being baptized and so much as a big toe is sticking up out of the water. And I say, uh-uh, we got to do it again. Why? Because it's adherence. Now, I don't know about you, but right here, I've got the heading, not legalism in Christ. And there are those who would say, oh, now if you're going to tell me that somebody baptized and their toes sticking them out of the water they're going to hell that's legalism Corey. well doctor let me you give me your definition of legalism because in the last 15 years you never have been able to I tell you it is obedience and you tell me that if you're going to go out here and bury someone at Old Orchard and you're going to leave their toes sticking up out of the ground you going to do that no you ain't going to do it why is it any different it's not. It's not. Colossians 2, while you're there, I'm glad this come up. Start at verse 13. <clears throat> Continuing that thought, he says, And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Verse 14. Pay attention. Watch it, open your ears and listen. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and has taken it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. People today will ask the Lord to help them keep the Ten Commandments. Why are you here today if you're keeping the Ten Commandments? Shouldn't you have been here yesterday? Mm hmm. Well, well, well now that, that don't apply. Which ones do? Which ones do? I'll wait. Ten Commandments are not multiple choice. No, they're not. None of them apply to us today. <gasps> did you just say that? I did. You mean it's okay? No, I don't mean it's okay to murder. I don't mean it's okay to take the Lord's name in vain. I don't mean it's okay to put other gods before God. But I will tell you what the Apostle Paul, the inspired Apostle Paul through the Holy Spirit tells me in Colossians 2 verse 14, he has taken out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, contrary to us, and nailed it to the cross. You know what we live under today? The law of Jesus. And if you will look, many of that 
things found in the old law are right there with the law of Jesus. But they're by his authority. And what I asked you a while ago, why are you even here today? Shouldn't be. Old law, you should have been here yesterday on the Sabbath. And I hope you didn't walk more than three quarters of a mile yesterday. What do you mean by that? That's exactly why you need to study it. The old law, the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments do not apply to us today. And to ask the Lord to help you keep the Ten Commandments, you better be offering up some incense. You better go find a goat sacrifice. You don't want to get back under that bondage. Paul warned the early church. He said, why do you want to go back into the bondage of the Old Testament? You have the grace of Jesus Christ today. The blood of Jesus Christ can redeem you today. Finally, Hebrews chapter 1. I think I've dragged on long enough this morning. Hebrews chapter 1. People asking things of God that simply they don't understand what it is they're asking for. Hebrews 1, beginning at verse 1. This is a big one today. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he has made the world. When people ask the Lord to speak directly to How does he speak to us today? Through Jesus. How does he do that? Through his word. In the beginning was the word. The word was God. The word was with God. He was Jesus. And when you ask God to tell you something, Lord, just, just tell me. Okay. Here it is. It's called the word of God. Open it up and read it. His answers have not changed throughout the years. They're not going to change. There's not going to be any revisions to it. You got what you got. The only person, the only people that need to be changing are you and I by the standard given through God's word. So many other examples we could look at this morning of what people ask for and they simply don't know what it is they're asking for. The question this morning becomes, though, what is it that you are waiting on? Why are you waiting? Why do you keep putting off obedience to the word of God? You've heard the gospel, no doubt. Romans 10, 14, 17. Jesus Christ, the son of God, came to this earth, lived a perfect sinless life from the time it came appointed to him. When he could have gotten out of it, he went to the cross, suffered the pain, the the humiliation, the agony of that, the abandonment that he felt all alone, dying there on a cross. Why? Because you and I and every other person from the beginning of time until the world comes to an end needs a redeemer from sin. He did absolutely nothing deserving of death. And he took your place and my place on that cross for death. You must be obedient to the gospel just as Jesus became the author of eternal salvation through obedience. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he says, Father, if there is any way that this responsibility, this cup can pass from me, let it be so, but not my will, but yours be done. Hebrews 11, verse 6, you must believe the gospel. You can't just go through the motions because without faith, it is impossible to please God. Acts 17, verse 30, you've got to be willing to change. You've got to be willing to change. You've got to turn away from the world and understand that the world is dying. It is passing away. It is full of sin. And you've got to have your eyes fixed upon Jesus, turning towards Jesus, leaving that worldly lifestyle behind, and instead devoting yourself to the service of Jesus Christ, the spread of the gospel, the good news, and service to him. Romans 10, 10, you must confess that belief with Jesus Christ. You believe it in your heart, but it manifests itself when it comes out of your mouth. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God as the eunuch did. 
And then you must be baptized into Christ. Mark 16, 16, Galatians 3, 27, Romans 6, so many more we can go on. Jesus says in Revelation 2, verse 10, be faithful unto death. And that means even if someone says, I'm going to kill you if you confess your faith in Jesus Christ, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Paul told Timothy, I have fought the good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. And now I get my crown. I get my reward. And not only me, but to all those who love the appearing of Jesus Christ. As we said earlier, 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 to 9, those who do not want to see Jesus come back. Those who will be gobbled up in flaming fire through vengeance by Jesus Christ with all those who do not obey his gospel. Have you obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ? We ask today, just as the question was asked of Saul, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling upon his name, putting to death the old man of sin, burying him in the watery grave of baptism and rising to walk in newness of life. Do you love Jesus today? Why would you not? How could you not love Jesus for what he has done for you? Paving the way, opening the door for you to eternal salvation. And he says a very simple thing. If you love me in John 14, 15, keep my commandments. Do you say you love him, but you really don't? Because the apostle John also speaks of that. First John 2, verse 4, whoever says I know him, and doesn't keep his commandments as a liar and the truth is not in him. There are 256 of their song of invitation this morning. It's not limited to the 10 to 11 o'clock hour on Sunday morning at 203 Russell Street. Anytime, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, when you're ready to accept salvation on God's conditions, he's ready to save you and add you to his church that his son Jesus Christ died for. But until you are ready to make that decision, you are separated from God. You have no hope. You're eternally lost. And those scenarios that we talked about a while ago could very well be you. You don't know what today or tomorrow or the next day holds. But I can tell you what right now is. Right now is the time to assure your eternal salvation. Don't put it off. Don't play roulette with your soul. Are you ready to obey the gospel today? We're ready to assist you. God's ready to add you to his family. Jesus is ready to wash you in his blood, taking away the stain of sin and giving you that hope of knowing that you can spend eternity with him. If we can help you today, let it be known as we sing. Who let the Lord
lest he may thrust across the count. For 151. <clears throat> One, five, one. Jesus came to the cross there, a precious man, a friend to all the beauty train, rose from Calvary town. give thanks for the unleavened bread. Following this first day of the week, we gather together here with the body of Christ to remember the great sacrifice that Jesus made for us. That he loved us enough that he knew we needed a redeemer from sin. That when he could have very well taken his seat on the throne of David in the temple, he chose to suffer the affliction of the cross, dying for us there, shedding his precious blood, that we through his death, his burial, and his resurrection have a hope. Amen. Let us give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Likewise, Father, we thank you for this cup, this fruit of the vine, which to us is symbolic of the blood that Jesus shed on the cross of Calvary. And the night he was betrayed, he took the cup from the Passover feast and he gave it to those with him. And he said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Your word tells us that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. And it is only the lamb, the blood of the lamb of God, Jesus Christ, that could take away the stain that separates us from you and allow us to stand holy before you. And your word tells us that when we sin and we fall short of your glory, that if we confess our faults to you, that the blood that Jesus Christ shed can continually cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
May we examine ourselves to find ourselves worthy of the blood that he shed on the cross and take of it in a manner pleasing to you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> this time let us reflect upon all the many blessings the Lord has bestowed upon us this past week and give back to him accordingly Father today we acknowledge that without you we have nothing that you have so richly blessed us with all the things that we have need of in this life and your word has told us that if we'll seek you first that we'll have nothing to worry about we thank you for the opportunities you afford to us, the opportunities you give us to go into work and to labor and to provide for our families. And today we give back to you a portion of what you have so richly blessed us with, that your word could go out into this community and even throughout this world, that many lost souls could be brought to the knowledge of Jesus Christ and they too could enjoy the blessings found only in Christ. And we give back cheerfully knowing that what we do here today could help one precious soul Learn of your son, Jesus Christ, for it's in his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> As we depart today, let's be reminded of what the Lord calls us to do. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Opportunities are around us every single day. Share the truth of Jesus Christ with someone. It's how we choose to use our time and utilize it and seek those opportunities and capitalize on them. It's time to go to work outside these doors in the vineyard of the Lord. Number 87. Number 87. Brother Paul dismisses. I'm not ashamed to walk. Amen. Yeah. 